So first things first, Ian, how are you? I'm well, thank you very much. <laughs> it's very good to hear. Now I can see behind you, uh, you seem to be in your studio. What did it mean to you to be able to finish that studio behind you in, in the past year? I mean, it was, you know, obviously I, I wanted to have a studio at home just so I could work um, and write here at home and, and be able to record demos and, and all my ideas and in, in the type of quality that, you know, would translate to an album later should we want to use anything. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times the initial ideas for songs are kind of the most special. And uh, it happens a lot that when you try to re-record them or you know, reproduce that initial feeling in a big studio or whatever, uh, you tend to lose that intimacy um, that the demo had. So for me, it's really important to try to track everything well right from the beginning. And so I never expected that we'd record a whole album down here. Okay. But, um, you know, I set up the room so that it sounds good and I have everything I need down here to to be able to work. And um you know, we just ended up being super lucky that we could use the space um, during COVID to to work safely and uh, efficiently and, and get our album done super quickly as well. Because were you expecting to make an album this soon? No, no, definitely not. I mean, uh, I tend to write quite a lot anyway, just gather okay. ideas. I mean, music is just a part of me. And um, I knew that we wouldn't be playing any shows for a long time. And uh, I just kind of, would come down to the studio and, and process everything that was going on and uh, was collecting a lot of songs, which was really great because I haven't mm -hmm. had the the opportunity to work so concentrated since before our first album, How. Right. And um, yeah, I ended up writing just a ton of music because yeah, it was just flowing. And, um, you know, I figured we'd end up using it at some point. We'd kind of just go through all the songs and, uh, pick the ones that we liked. And once we decided to do this TV show over here in Germany, um, it became pretty clear to everybody that we should just take the songs that I'd been writing and finish them up, record them and, and have an album ready for, uh, for the show when it, when it airs. And um, just really lucky that I did the legwork early um, and that we're already coming out with a new album here soon. So. Let's explore that a little bit then, because when did you find songwriting and, and what did it do for you when you kind of discovered that you could put those thoughts onto paper and, and turn it into something creative? Um, I started writing songs in high school. Um, I played saxophone for a long time and then I stopped playing that because I thought it was uncool, <laughs> unfortunately. And do you still uh, play I it? Playing Sorry. I don't know. It's been a long, long, long time. No, I never, I just started playing guitar and I enjoyed it so much more because I mean, I could sing and play at the same time sure. with saxophone. Your mouth is pretty busy. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I found that that I actually enjoyed singing and um, it was just a, a great way to kind of, you know, put all of life's up and downs um, to music. You know, initially it was just for myself, but it's a type of therapy, you know, and, uh, it was really healthy for me to to process my life through music, even if it was just for me or like, you know, my best friends who were the only ones who knew that I was even interested in doing these things. You know, we'd sit around the fires on the beach and I'd bring my guitar down and we'd play. And um, it was only much, much, much later once I'd moved to Germany after college that I, I really entertained the notion of, of showing other people, you know, because yeah, a lot of my songs are autobiographical or they're about people. If they're not about me, they're about people that I know and love. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a lot to open yourself up to sure. the critiques of other people. I mean, sure. it's, you know, if you're a musician, you got one shot at, at making music kind of for that project that you're in. And, uh, you know, you get people who come around and they look at, you know, probably 10, 20 bands a day and they're kind of like, I like, it, I don't like it, this or that. And, you know, it's, they're actual people who, who, who are behind the songs and at least in my case i put a lot of myself into it so yeah it mm -hmm. took me a while to kind of gain that confidence and um it was ultimately a very great experience of course it's led to a lot of adventures in my life i find your explanation very interesting because this is just a connection i made so i don't know if it's very uh, if it's true or not but in uh, land of broken dreams 
you mentioned um, uh, there's a line, but now those dreams are all uh, uh, you got beneath your feet. Now that reminded me of uh, W.B. Yeats' uh, poem. Now I don't know if it's inspired by that poem, but it kind of I've always interpreted that poem as uh, it goes. I think yeah. something along the lines of uh, I check. Uh, what, what was it again? I, yeah, I spread, spread my, my dreams, dreams I, yeah, yeah. beneath your feet, tread softly for you tread, tread on lightly. my dreams. And I've all, always felt like that is kind of the plight of an artist. You have these kind of, you put yourself out there and pe people can walk all over it. So please tread lightly. So exactly. has that song I mean, you're been... Very, you're very well read also to be quoting Yeats. He's an Irish poet <laughs> and I uh, appreciate that very much. Yes. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, was that inspired by that poem? I mean, I, I definitely have... Um, a book of Yeats poetry okay. here. And, and um, I do enjoy it very, very much. I think he's, I, I really don't read very much poetry. I find a lot of it to be very, very, very difficult. <laughs> um, just to, and so abstract and, you know, sure. um, not as profound as people think it is, but I, I think Yeats is really very talented. And um, yeah, I mean, for sure. I, uh, I guess maybe subconsciously that please tread lightly on, on, on my dreams for the, you know, it's like, basically it's all you have. And in, mm -hmm. in land of broken dreams, it's more of kind of like, you know, it's the American dream is, is such a farce these days and the middle sure. class is all but gone and the richer getting richer, poor getting poorer. And it's, it's a mess for sure. But at, at the end of the day, I, I really, really admire, you know, your, your average Joe in America for still believing mm -hmm. in, in himself enough to, to work his ass off day in, day out, believing that he'll see his dreams through to the end, you know? And like, if you slip through the cracks in America, you fall far. And right. um, uh, basically at the end of the day, you're all you got. And your dreams, those things that you believe in, they're the only thing holding you up. That's all you got left beneath your feet to kind of keep you mm -hmm. from, from giving up. And um you know, Yates is, Ir uh, is Irish. I'm, I'm an Irish American. My mother is from Dublin. Right. Um, and so I kind of, I guess, would have, I interpreted it a few generations later <laughs> um, as an American and right. uh, from my perspective. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a sad thing to find hope in, but I still find hope in, and great admiration in, in people who don't give up on themselves. There is some, I do think it's very admirable, even if it, if it can be naive at times, it's very admirable to just just see the world in, in a positive light almost, kind of yeah. ignoring uh, maybe sometimes the difficulties of life, but but at least going for it, at least giving it a shot. There's there's something yeah. very admirable in, it, uh, admirable in that, I think. And, and I do have to mention, I'm, I don't know a lot of poetry. I just happen to know that a particular one. I just want to... Well, there you go, man. You know the good ones anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, but let's uh, go on on that then, because... Uh, what was it like once you once you did share your your music? Was that a kind of was that a very liberating moment once people once you felt people were responding positively? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the beginning, uh, you always have this kind of like newcomer bonus, you know, like nobody's heard about you before. Anything that's new is always interesting to people. You know, it's always kind of like the new the young kid who's out there making music, you know, if you have a story to tell, people are going to listen to it. And, um, you know, I realized pretty quickly that people saw something, especially when I was performing my songs. And, you know, it's a really great feeling to share such a, you know, intimate stories about yourself and to have complete strangers standing in front of you and, and finding something maybe completely different in it for themselves, sure. but at least, you know, at least finding enough of a connection to the music to cheer for you at the end of a, uh, a, a song. And um, yeah, I definitely fed on that and I, and I loved it, but I always knew like, it's a very fickle life. It's a very fickle industry. It's um, you know, people, people lose interest just as quickly as they find interest. Right. And, um, and I'm still like that. Like I, I really appreciate the people who have been with mighty Oaks, me for, for from the very beginning, because I mean, that's, it's hard to come by these days that somebody will stand by you that long. Um, but, you know, I don't take anything for granted. And I also don't take myself or anything too seriously because I realize it's, you know, there's so many musicians these days and everyone's making a go of it. Um, and so I'm just, I'm happy. I take it all in. 
and I appreciate what I have very much, but, um, you know, I try to try to try to keep the, uh, the initial flame that I had at the very beginning of playing live and playing for people and, and kind of making a connection to, to people playing live. Um, that's the best part for me. And that's what I still love the most about it actually. Well, with that in mind then, because you mentioned that this album process from Mexico reminded you more of when you initially started when when the whole business side kind of wasn't there yet and you had time to work on it sure. so did it did it kind of bring you back to that mental uh, mentality yeah definitely i mean um you know there was just zero pressure mm. um while i was writing because i mean everything was in a state of transition and, and kind of chaos in a sense sure. nobody really knew what was going to happen in the next 12 months i mean i still feel like people don't really know what's going to happen in the next 12 months but um you know i was able to just be kind of open and and to take all of the new challenges that were being presented to me uh mm. because of the pandemic uh and and put them to music and so it was just like hey there's no pressure no one's expecting me to come up with anything and i'm finding a creative vein in in the hardships that's going that are going around and um Yeah, it was. It just felt like the beginning, you know, like where I could just sit down and nobody expect anything of me, and I was just kind of writing about the, the shitty long distance relationship I had back then, or you know, like being a young kid and want to travel more, not having any money to do so or whatever. So, um, yeah, it was really healthy and it was really encouraging, also to just be able to do it here at home mm -hmm. in my studio, to be able to go downstairs, you know, with a cup of coffee and and just kind of to work and not have to, you know, drive somewhere, go to a big studio, pay for that time. Um, and so I, I definitely felt, you know, the most connected to this album as, as I have since we started making music together. So yeah, no, yeah, I'm hoping you, that others oh, do as well. <laughs> yeah. I believe you also mentioned that, that the record to you feels a lot more uh, co coherent because of it, that, that because of it was, wasn't written kind of, uh, here and there in between tours and and but it was more of a cohesive process um so when you listen to the record now or if, if you imagine the record now what do you hear in it in a way is it is it very much a time stamp of, of last year for me yeah i mean i guess the coherence that i see in the album is is you know from an outsider's perspective perhaps non-existence non-existent because there are a lot of different topics on the album it's right. not just about one thing it's sure. not just about like one struggle or, or one person or anything but for me it's it's just really coherent because even though all those songs are about different things uh they have different sounds um i was still writing them so quickly back to back that you know, I was able to go like, okay, I have a song about this. I have a song about that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, you know, like trying to piece things together over such a long period of time. And you tend to lose connections to things that you've written in the past. And um, at least I do anyway. And I just feel like there's a, there's a, a healthy breadth of, of topics covered in this album from mental health to, you know, uh, class you know class classes in society on land of broken dreams um mm -hmm. you know love songs your classic one like forever or your kind of sure. non-classic love song like on ghost um you know songs for people that mean something to you like you know by your side uh, what are you fighting for a song that's you know just kind of like about the fallings out i've had with friends of mine in the past okay. year because they've kind of just lost their minds about you know what <laughs> what it means to be part of a society and, right, and whining right. about whining about freedoms and stuff that i feel is silly because they're white males living in you know white male dominated western societies but anyway um i it was just yeah i feel like the songs work well together mm -hmm. so well yeah. let's jump into a couple of songs because uh, and we'll see how deep we we go because you say they are uh very autobiographical or at least um uh, mm -hmm from the people around you or yourself. And uh, there's a couple of things that I that I've felt uh, were very interesting. Like you mentioned uh, ghosts and I wrote the line down, true love is hard. When did you find out that true love was hard? Because I believe you are happily married, right? I'm happily married, yeah. I mean, and you know, it's being in a long relationship with anybody, you're gonna have your up and downs too, for sure. So, um, you know, Thankfully, we have a very healthy relationship with one another. But you know, it's not like it's not, it's not my first rodeo. I've definitely yeah. been in 
in long relationships before and they've ended in, you know, unhappy situations. And, you know, when you feel like you're super comfortable with somebody and, and you really open yourself up, you become very vulnerable and that, that comes with the, you know, you get the good and the bad with that. And, and it doesn't always work out, you know, because of you or because of the other person. And, um, you know, true love can be, can be quite painful. Um, right. And I think that's a testament to, you know, my relationship with my wife is because even though we have maybe had tough times together and like, we're still together and we're, you know, happier now than we ever have been. And that's the most important thing, you know? Right. And yeah, you, uh, you, uh, you have then a song like forever where you, you kind of described that first day and that kind of, uh, that love that you had for, uh, I still have for her. So with that song in particular, uh, I want to do, um, how should I frame, uh, phrase this? How does she re respond uh, to these type of songs? Do, do you show them uh, to her before you kind of put them on an album? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, also, she was here while we were recording. Oh, fair enough. Everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, I show her my demos sometimes of the songs, you know, like um, Gold to Me, I never really showed her. That's a song okay. about the first day we met. Um, and forever i mean forever is a song that we'd actually been working on for quite some time and never really quite found a way to make it work um and you know that song can be about my wife it could also be about my kids it could be you know for the people who listen to it i think it's written generally enough that people are going to be able to adapt that to their own lives you know it's not just about you know husband wife or husband husband wife wife whatever sure. it can be about anybody that means some something important to you What is her reaction when you write the song that kind of deals with her? Um, I mean, obviously, it, it it certainly means a lot to her, but I don't think that she. I don't think she, I mean she, we. I've okay. got a lot of songs that I've written already for sure, and and a lot about you know us and our kids and stuff, and um, she definitely loves them and she appreciates them very much. Um, but I think she also loves, you know, the songs that aren't about her more to right. a certain degree. I think she's, she's quite objective about, you know, which songs she likes and she doesn't let the fact that maybe one or the others about her or, or us or our family or something to, to dictate her, mm -hmm. her relationship to it. Yeah. Then, uh, you mentioned, uh, what you're fighting for, um, mm -hmm. This is kind of about also, the, I suppose, the division that has started to creep in uh, in the last couple of years uh, in, in society and, and in the world, I suppose. Um, yeah. But what, what, what is interesting, and I always like these type of songs, is that the melody, the, the sonic landscape of that song isn't very depressing or very... No. It's, it's, it's just quite jolly, actually, I would say. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of an indie rock song, you know, it's like... That kind yeah. of dichotomy. What, what, why did you put that in? I don't know. We like, we like doing that in our music and um, it just, I mean, when I wrote it, it was on, it was just on an acoustic guitar. It was pretty raw and emotional and, you know, it could have gone either way. Um, Claudio kind of picked up on this melody and started playing with his electric guitar and it took it into kind of a more, yeah, light or uplifting direction. And we all just felt that was, you know, good not to make the song kind of be negative and dark and, you know, preachy to a certain way. It's just kind of more like, you know, impartial um, to a certain degree. It should spark someone to, you know, think critically about what they're doing in their lives and not feel like someone's being dark and kind of, you know, like judgmental of them. Um, mm -hmm. I think the tone of the song sets the stage hopefully for a dialogue and not necessarily just for like, right. a you know, a one way street and saying kind of like, what are you fighting for, man? Because you're obviously wrong. It's kind of more like, do you really understand what what you're doing? Like, what are you fighting for? I mean, I feel like you you, you kind of get loud when you get online and, and you you talk out your ass. But do you know what you're talking about, man? So it's it's more along that tone than being like, hey, man, fuck you. <laughs> like, right. You know? Well, that makes sense. Well, the one thing I've found in, in recent years, uh, especially online with this whole thing, is that people seem to be more invested in, in trying to win an argument than, than speaking the truth in a way. They just yeah. want to win for their side or whatever. So it's, it's you just it's, realize that there's such a hunger to speak in the world. You know, like I feel mm. like so many people, they don't have the opportunity to actually have 
real conversations with people in their lives sometimes. And so they go online and they, you know, they play devil's advocate or they pick fights or, you know, it's trolls right. and they're looking, they're looking just basically to create negative energy in the world. And I think it's just disgusting. I mean, Mike Tyson said it best. He was like, this social media is, has made you guys all so comfortable with, you know, like insulting mm. somebody and not getting punched in the face <laughs> for it. You know, it's like, exactly, exactly. Yes. I mean, it's like, are you going to say these things to somebody in their face? And even if you, I mean, I don't know. It's not like I'm going to go around punching people in the face, <laughs> but I feel like people, people just act differently when you're, when you're face to face, you know? Of course, of course. And that's, uh, I suppose, well, we'll probably, we'll see in a couple of decades what kind of effect this whole so, uh, social media generation will have on, on, on yeah. our societies and our psychological constitutions. It's going to be Narcissistic, yeah. self-centered, uh, spoiled crazy people running around it's yeah i mean i don't know well my personal view is uh we as human beings aren't uh smart or capable enough to ha handle this kind of technology we just no we, we don't I have no idea how to yeah. how to work it but yeah then the, but luckily an offshoot of this technology is that you get to share all this uh, music with people even in a time where you can't travel so to to round off this interview what are you able to do in the upcoming months? Well, we're part of this television show in Germany, which is prime time and it's, you know, runs for eight weeks. So that's giving us definitely a lot of exposure, if nothing else right now to right. definitely more of a mainstream audience, which is great. Um, and I mean, we'll see, we're definitely booking shows for the summer now um, that are all supposed to be kind of Corona conform and, um certainly hoping that you know at least half of them will happen because uh, <laughs> sure. it would just be good for us um and then we'll see i mean i i continue to write i wouldn't be surprised if you know if we decided to to record an ep or something in the fall um definitely just trying to keep the creativity going i mean we were a band that has no problem writing music and recording it now that we know that we can get great sounds out of the basement right. you know we're much more um autonomous in, in how we work and um we'll see i mean obviously 2022 is hopefully going to be full of, of quite a few shows but time will tell um you know if, if nothing else we'll be ready with music and uh, hope that people just continue to listen to it and, and find something and you know i guess the plus side of it is we'll, we're releasing all this new music and people are being given the opportunity to consume it to you know get to know it and really learn the song so that once we do play a show again um you know i think people will have a much deeper connection to the new music than they normally do because you know usually it happens you release an album and you go on tour like right away with it people have barely had time to listen to it so um yeah well one last thought then you because you mentioned you're always writing where is your mind at uh these days then in terms of the songwriting I think it's definitely far away from COVID or any kind of, I'm, I, I'm not, I find that I'm not being political at all in the songs that I'm writing right now. They're more just kind of abstract, I guess. They're not really even about me. They're just about relationships between people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like them. I'm kind of putting myself into somebody else's shoes that I've never met before and just kind of thinking about, you know, how it could be. And I feel very comfortable doing that. So uh, we'll see. Sounds interesting. Yeah, we'll see uh, what you come up with. Ian, thank you so thank much you, for taking the time uh, to talk with me. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well.